Welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Kyle. I'm Nina, and happy Pride Month, everyone. From the bottom of our hearts, we do hope this month is a good one for everyone out there. For today's episode, we want to discuss representation in debating. This is often overlooked, I would say, but luckily, it's gaining more traction, especially with a lot of equity teams all over the world creating their own zero-tolerance policies, their own rules on debating, and own ways of making sure that people get to join debate and partake in this particular sport. Yeah, and to talk to us about representation, we are joined with Nico Bombeo, who is the president of Philippine Debate Union and also, and they told us to say this, a self-proclaimed gay bitch from everywhere. They are also very single and very ready to mingle, wink wink. So welcome to the show, Miko. Hi. Hello. Hi, it's it's so great to be here. Uh, just to clarify, the reason why I'm a gay bitch from everywhere is because I was born in Iloilo. So I grew up in the Visayas circuit. I started debating there. And then I moved to Mindanao and I continued debating here. And I'm soon planning to move to Manila to hopefully pursue some, you know, marooner pastures, wink, wink, <laughs> and I'll probably be debating there as well. So yeah, I'm basically from everywhere. And before we continue, I'd like to give a shout out to a good friend, Jay Postrado, who wanted me to give them a shout out. Hello, great to be here. Shout out to Jay Postrado. Hi, Jay. Hi, Jay. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for agreeing to be on our podcast. You've been planning this episode for a few months now, actually. So we're so glad to be able to finally do it, especially given this month, Pride Month. Um, this is quite a broad topic. Um, so we're probably going to cut this episode into different segments to be able to dissect how representation plays a role in debating in general. So we'll be talking about institutional and regional representation, gender representation, as well as representation in debate education. So to get things started first, um, the first question we'd like to ask is, what really is representation? How should we be defining it for the benefit of this episode? Okay, so for representation, there are like, probably three levels. Levels, but there are like generally a few things that you need to consider in order to understand what representation is. So if you want to talk about debate representation, it occurs in terms of like um, circuit representation. So what circuit you come from, if you're from the Mindanao circuit, the Saya circuit, if it's an international tournament, if you're from the Philippines or the Iona circuit or the Indian circuit, for example, there's also gender representation, which is something that is very, I would say important. And I I would also say very relevant right now, especially given that it's Pride Month, but also because um, at the start of online tournaments, people made it um, a rule, not really a rule, but a suggestion that you introduce your preferred gender pronouns before you start your speeches, um, along with like your POI preferences or whatever. And it's like a really fresh and like interesting thing to um, experience because in physical tournaments, we would just go to the podium and like say, um, give me a few seconds to arrange our paper or maybe even just stay silent and just arrange your papers there. But now that it's online, you get to introduce yourself. You get to um, tell people how to properly address you, how you identify as, if you're comfortable sharing, of course. And I think it's really interesting because the debate community has always been a very open and a very like loving community to even the like, even the people who belong at the margins, who are like minorities. And it's really nice to see that there are efforts like these um, that make people feel included and make people feel seen. The other type of representation, I would say, is also in terms of um, debating ability, like novices, um, younger kids who are getting interested in debate, um, primarily because they're usually mostly at home and they don't know what to do. And then they see people um, screaming at their laptops. So they're like, oh, that's a fun sport. I, what, what if I join it? Or like, what if they, I invest in it? And because of that, and because of the online setup, um, accessibility has something that uh, is something that has boomed and has allowed for a lot of more novice speakers, judges, and generally just debaters to like come out of the ether and join our beautiful, our little like debate community. And it's really fun to see um, young minds like entering debate and like having a fresh start in it as well. So yeah, I think if we want to talk about representation, we could talk about like all those multiple things. So as you can see, and I guess what I got from that was that representation isn't just limited to gender, but involves 
quite a lot of things like general access to the sport as well as like how welcome you feel about it. So what challenges has the debate community in our circuit particularly? What has it faced in terms of getting people to join events and join tournaments? Like ever since and even now. So I think it is in the nature of debating to be slightly intimidating because people, if especially if people don't know what debating is, um, and they see you like previously in physical tournaments or in physical in, in times where we were allowed to go to school, um, they would see us as like people who would just sit around a table or in a room and then talk about like topics that might not be a topic of conversation for like the regular individual or like someone who is just sitting at a coffee shop with their friends, for example, talking about things. So we would talking would we would be talking about like IR or like philosophy and economics. And sometimes it's intimidating because they wonder how can they have access to this type of knowledge to form this these types of opinions and um, allow themselves to make arguments out of those beliefs and perceptions. But um, especially now in online, uh, in the online setting, while it is still something that um, is intimidating to a lot of people, it's become easier to reach out and actually like show people what debating really is. Um, especially because there are a lot of um, controversies and points of contention within society that are more accessible, I would say, and more visible um, because people are always online. They always see on Twitter or on Facebook what's currently happening around the world. They see people airing out their opinions about certain things that the government is doing, for example, or certain things that the government is not doing. And I guess it intrigues them to a certain extent, and it allows them to discover debate in a way that is more approachable and i i also believe that like debate circuits and debate communities all around the philippines and even around the world um have made it so that their communities are more welcoming to people who want to start debating yeah so since we're talking about debate representation right now i wanted to ask you what do our regional debaters face like what problems or like situations that they have to face with regard to representation in the debate sphere um, that because like I have never um, I'm not from um, outside of Metro Manila like although I live in Baco or Cavite I've always been debating for like Metro Manila based school so I'm not necessarily aware of like these different experiences but I do understand that there is a, a sort of like <laughs> I don't know if there's a better term than like Manir Manila imperialist or maybe metro imperialist when it comes to um, Philippine debating. So like what experiences that um, could you share to us um, that are felt by um, people from different regions that might not be um, that might not be known to people from the Metro Manila area. Yeah. So caveat, I'm just sharing like experiences that have been told to me and things that I may have like experienced as well. But I would definitely say that there previously, like there used to be a imperial Manila mindset or like culture when it came to debate, especially in nationals. Um, and this was the time before team codes happened. So um, people who came from regional institutions or institutions outside Metro Manila, for example, would generally feel like, uh, like we generally feel like we have a greater or heavier burden to prove the things that we are arguing um, by virtue of us coming from a school that isn't um, exactly active in a school, like, for example, yeah, let's not name drop schools, but like schools that belong in Metro Manila um, uh, yeah, and the general like area where the quote unquote Imperial Manila culture exists. Um, so there was definitely um, that type of feeling. It was minimized in NDC 2019, where I first experienced team codes. So um, I do feel like it did benefit a lot of people, especially, uh, especially regional institutions. Um, when it came to appreciation, because there were instances where judges um, would just look at the institution or the team letter of that institution and assess their, basically their worth or the credibility of their argument. 
based on that based on those letters that appear on the matchup but now since there are team codes we are basically like obligated to assess the round um based on what's happening which is really what should be happening but we can't deny that there are institutions that gain favor over other institutions as well um even regionally there are institutions that have quote unquote clout that are generally included in decision making um for like in tournaments or in rounds and it it allows it doesn't allow for like other institutions that may have promising um debaters with a lot of potential to like actually feel their worth in the round because they go up against the school that is prominent in the regional debating scene i think it's very interesting and important that you brought up team codes because like i i do agree and i have personally felt this before where you would see like some institutions that you that they might have more clout and then they suddenly like they I, I I don't know but from when I began debating in a school that was very new talking about some in Middle Earth eh? mm. yeah and and we we're like one of the first people to have debated for that school um we we felt it was really difficult to win over more influential institutions so I definitely feel that frustration as well so I can't even imagine how difficult it must feel for. Um, uh, people from different regions, not even from Metro Manila, who <laughs> have to feel the same way. But aside from team codes, what else can we as a community do in order to increase regional representation in debate? I mean, I definitely feel like online tournaments have made regional institutions more prominent um, because regional institutions are able to join Manila-based or Luzon-based tournaments that we weren't able to access in the past because you know, previously, in a long, long time before COVID, everyone, um, we had to pay for everything just to make it to a tournament. So if you're from Cagayan de Oro, like I am, you had to pay for flights. Sometimes you have to pay for hotel rooms if it's an IV. You had to pay for like your living expenses just to go to, um, let's say, Manila InterVarsity or the Liman Debate Open. And so, uh, a lot of the institutions do not have that, like, type of support from their administration. So most of the time it comes out of the pockets of um, the debaters themselves or alumni support. So it was really difficult to um, scout or pick what tournaments we would be joining um, in a certain year. So before COVID, I would actually only be able to join like around four, five tournaments. And that's already a lot. So like that's NDC, two MPDCs, a VMDC, and like maybe an IV um, if I had the extra like money laying around from saving up, which Nina knows I don't. <laughs> but um, now that it's online and reg fees are relatively cheaper, um, and when I say relatively, I mean incredibly cheaper compared to physical tournaments, uh, regional institutions and regional debaters have been able to join um, Luzon-based tournaments and even international tournaments as well. Um, and vice versa, Luzon debaters have been able to join um, tournaments that were Mindanao-based. So this year, we saw a lot of Luzon teams that were able to join Mindanao InterVarsity, which we will be repeating this year, by the way. Shameless plug. But um, yeah, so a lot of Luzon teams are able to join MIV. And in the past, we would only see like five or six um, non-Mindanao institutions or non vismin institutions that join MIV. Because we understand the plane ticket to um, CDO is relatively expensive because it's not that often that people go to CDO. Um, but now that it's online, we have a lot of participation. So I guess an exchange of knowledge, an exchange of like identity also happens in online tournaments. Like you get to know people that you would only see in debate videos. You would get to talk to people regularly, um, like compared to the past where you could only see them in tournaments. Like, I talk to Nina almost every day because of work. And previously we would only talk about like once every, uh, like once a few months if there, if something comes up or if we wanted to get Nina for Agecore. So it's a really interesting thing that, you know, the COVID pandemic happened, it's sad. And it like left us to stay in our homes until everyone gets vaccinated. But it also opened up opportunities for us to come together as a community, get to know people who we might have not met in the past. So I wanted to ask though what your experience would be internationally. So we know that online has made the Philippine community kind of more tight-knit. Would you be able to say the same with our experience with other circuits and 
other tournaments abroad. Because personally, I haven't joined a lot of tournaments abroad. I'm still rather intimidated. And that might be another factor that comes into play here in terms of representation. Like, I don't think, like, I'm representing the Philippines as much as I should and probably can. But I heard that you have been competing quite a lot in different tournaments abroad. And you have seen our students compete in different tournaments abroad. So what sort of nuances did you notice that we can maybe adopt in our own setting or even just keep in mind? So it's interesting because international tournaments, there are a few things to consider. Um, so the first, the main thing that you have to consider is reg fee because it's relatively more expensive co- compared to like the Philippine reg fee. Um, they usually set like $10 to register $20 per speaker. Uh, so that's like a huge jump from the 200 to 300 per team that we see in like the Philippine setting. But the second thing that you have to consider is the time zone. So there was one time that I joined a tournament in that was based in the U.S. So it had the opposite hours like to us, like 12 hours around that like difference. So the tournament started at 9 p.m. I was partnered with Thea. It was Pan American Queer Open. Um, and we ended rounds on the first day at around like 8 a.m. So you have to prepare yourself for that grueling um, all-nighter type of vibe that like people barely experience um, unless it's like Hell Week. So there's that to consider. There are friendlier time zones. Like um, Indian tournaments, for example, are like two hours and 30 minutes uh, behind us. There's also like Singaporean, Malaysian tournaments and Australian tournaments um, who have relatively the same or like an hour-ish difference. Um, but another thing that you, well, my main takeaway from international tournaments is that a lot of debating circuits have a lot of different priorities, which is very interesting because the way I see it, if we're a debater who constantly um, participates in online tournaments, like internationally, you would be exposed to these different kinds of circuits. You would be exposed to like um, Iona, for example, who might prioritize pragmatic discussions and not necessarily value principle as much as the pragmatic impacts or you would um, participate in an Indian tournament where they are very intense when it comes to their responses and their call-outs towards your um, towards your team. And then when you go back to Philippine tournaments, you kind of take back what you see and what you learn from these international tournaments, and you slightly not, well, you kind of apply them as well to your own debating style. So it also changes the way that you debate, and it also changes the way that you um, like engage with your opponents in the round. And my like concern, not necessarily concern, or like my question is, what happens when people join enough international tournaments that it changes the debate meta and the people who weren't able to catch up or weren't able to adapt to um, international meta uh, like engage or like interact with these people in rounds? Like what will happen to um, people who might have debated in physical and not debate online. And then when they return to physical, it's already a whole new meta that's based on like other international circuits as well. So like inter- the international circuit is a very interesting beast to try and conquer, uh, mainly because it makes you very versatile and very like appreciative of multiple styles, multiple like um, trends and meta in debating. But it's also something that is scary because it forces you to evolve and it also makes you subconsciously try to apply that to your rounds locally as well. It's interesting because it seems to me that there's also a time element in representation. Like you have to be um, in with the times to be able to sort of get the the meta properly right so i guess the next question i have is what what ways can we ease the gap between those who are familiar with online debating and those who you know are better at offline debating so a a confession that i would like to make is that i feel like i won't i won't be able to speak standing up anymore (laughs) because it's gonna like make me feel exhausted and like out of breath so like there are things that Um, physical debaters and like online debaters have differently but the main way that we can bridge that gap between the two is to invest in more accessible debate education materials so um, a lot of there are a lot of um, companies and like 
entities out there that provide debate education to um, people um, for a certain price or sometimes even for free. And I think that's the best way to allow for other people to catch up. Something that is accessible anytime and, and doesn't necessarily require you to be at a certain place at a certain time. Um, I feel like that would help people um, f- like freely access this type of knowledge at their own pace. Like if you used to be a physical debater and you want to go back to debating on- and you want to engage in online debating, um, at least you have resources that you can read, that you can watch or listen to that allow you to um, get to know the meta of online debating before throwing yourself into this whole new entity of debating that came out because of the pandemic. So like things like debatable that allow for people to access debate education for free, I think is a really good way to help people get used to an online setting for that transition and vice versa as well. If you're an online debater and like miraculously the government gives us all vaccines before 2023 or 2022 um, and you want to go back to physical debating, um, resources such as debatable and other online um, materials on YouTube allow you to have that type of information, um, allow you to get to know what the proper decorum is in debate rounds, um, get to know what type of um, POIs should be raised or how to raise POIs, like how to stand up, how to have proper breath control, which I probably need because I can't speak without um, running out of breath if I'm standing up. So yeah, those types of things. Like debate education is something that's really important as well. Yeah, so I feel like what this entire experience has proved is even if we get out of the pandemic, there is still a reason for us to want to keep having online debates. So like it, it might be considered like a completely different thing in the future. Like, oh, is this a, a physical tournament or is this an online tournament? Even though both would be considered valid, especially since the representation issue is much fairer like the situation is marginally or i would say more than marginally fairer on the online space this episode of debatable is sponsored by us debatable intervarsities on its last days of phase two it ends on june 5 so if you haven't registered for debatable intervarsity yet don't miss your chance to do so at bit.ly dash debatable iv phase two You can also register to be an independent judge or apply to be one of our invited adjudicators who will pay to judge our tournament. We pay them pretty well here in this tournament. So you can register at bit.ly dash debatable IV judge registration. The links are in the description and on our Facebook and on our Twitter as well. Now back to the episode. Right now, we're going to be talking about gender representation because gender representation, on the other hand, started out through the prominence of women and LGBT when they finally joined the sport of debating, if we want to call that a sport. Um, There have even been tournaments that have made it a requirement for contingents to be represented by a percentage of individuals from these debate minorities. If I'm not mistaken, Worlds is one of them, right? Yeah, Worlds. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on this, Miko? And can this be seen as something that might be construed as negative or is it just positives all throughout? I mean, like anything, like in debate, there are always pros and cons to everything. But I would say that the inclusion of gender minorities and yeah, gender minorities in debate tournaments, like making it a requirement and such, is actually something that's relatively good because there is a lot of underappreciated women and gender minority speakers all around like the world and even in the Philippine circuit. Um, and it's a great way to highlight the homegrown talent that we have um, in the Philippines and like highlight it internationally. Tournaments such as the Queer Opens that um, the queer community, queer debating community um, have established as a great example of this where um, participants are all exclusively uh, exclusively queer. Um, so it's a great way to get to know queer debaters without having to go through the process of trying to assess whether they are queer or not. It's a really welcoming space um, and allows for people to meet um, generally like, like-minded people who also belong to the same community as them. One good experience I had was Trinity Women and Gender Minorities, um, which was a tournament that I joined way back in January, I think. And I partnered up with Bea Legaspi from UPD. And it was a tournament that was exclusive for women and gender minorities, <laughs> as you know, suggested by the name. And it was a really warm and open space. Uh, even though there was still competition, there was still a lot of intensity in the round. 
after the round, people would socialize, Zoom calls would be, uh, Zoom links would be sent in chat and people would be free to join them. And you would just talk about like, all, just normal things that you would talk about in a socializing aspect, like the socializing aspect of tournaments, like what time is it, where you're from, like what, what's, the, what's the weather <laughs> in your country, or like generally like debating cultures all around the world. And it was really intriguing because I had never been to a WGM tournament before. And it was a breath of fresh air because I identify as um, a gender non-binary. So I use they, them pronouns. And it's something that isn't really um, common right now because people perceive gender to be either your cisgendered or transgendered. Um, people who are agendered or non-binary aren't really as highlighted um, within society. So to have people who are similar or who have similar identities and experiences in these queer spaces, in these WGM spaces, is really an eye-opening experience to how welcoming the debate community can get um, in spite of the intensity that we have during rounds. Yeah, so I wanted to ask as well, because I've heard, well, I don't want to name drop, but I've heard some people that kind of complain about the existence of these tournaments, which, you know, is very weird to me, given that we're a debate community and we should be open to these things. But one of their main arguments is that it gives opportunities for some people to pad up their CVs that other people are not able to access, right? It's sort of like affirmative action, but to the detriment of the ability of certain people to gain like awards for or like something to add to their CV. What would you like to say to those people who sort of think in that strange binary? Well, the thing that I would like to say isn't family friendly, but um, if you think about it, every tournament that exists is open unless stated otherwise. So like, even if you say, oh, there's a queer open in America or in Europe or in Oceania, for example, there are also open tournaments in America, in Europe, and in Oceania that you can join. Like, you're free to join these tournaments. You can schedule your days around them. You can like take leaves off from work. You can well, don't skip class, even though I have skipped class to join the tournament, but you can skip class to join them, for example. And like you have so many options to join. Like if you want, there is around like two to three tournaments that happen every weekend. And if you really want to like pad your CV and add like experience to your belt, feel free to join all of them if they're in different time zones and they don't have delays. Like nothing is stopping you. But for you to target gender minorities and communities that have felt like they are underrepresented in normal spaces. It's just, you know, forgive my French, but it's just despicable. <laughs> it's it's very, it's, I don't know, it's very close-minded and like not welcoming and to be frank, not really the nature that a debater should have. Okay, yeah, I really do see your point. I agree with you, full stop. Um, there's also another criticism that I have heard personally. I don't know if Nina has heard this, but mm. Um, there is um, a perception that tournaments for the LGBT community and women exclusively are not like needed as forms of like affirmative action because that's um, the way that the person who told me this compared it to. They compared it to, firm to affirmative action. But they said that in the debate community, there isn't a real underrepresentation of members of the LGBT community or women in general. In fact, they told me that um, there needs to be a gender balance um, within teams. For example, kung BP, one should be a man, the other should be a woman, or something like that, biologically um, assigned at birth, you know. Um, and that would actually increase their chances of winning. So actually, my question to you is twofold. The first one is, is this a sort of affirmative action? And the second one is, are there facets of the LGBT community or women um, that are currently underrepresented in the debate community? So first question, I definitely feel like it is a valid form of affirmative action. Like, I want to talk to this person and ask them, what makes you think that this form of affirmative action is invalid? Like, 
if you think that this is invalid, do you also think that laws that revolve around gender security and like the safety of your soji um, is inherently invalid because people are being protected in society anyway. There's police, right? There's like separate bathrooms for men and women, etc. Do you think that a soji bill is affirmative action that isn't necessary because they're not getting harmed publicly anyway? Um, but also like there, uh, these tournaments exist because queer people felt the need to create it. And I feel like you don't get to dictate how they feel or like where they feel safe and where they want to feel comfortable debating in a tournament full of their queer peers or like full of women who um, want to debate because they love debating. And I think that affirmative action, while it's something that can be defined, is generally subject to how a community wants to be appreciated and protected. It's not black and white where you say this affirmative action is necessary, this is not. Because if you do not belong to that community, if you do not belong to that specific gender identity um, that wants to pursue this affirmative action, then you really have no right to dictate what affirmative action we deserve. Um, could you repeat the second question? <laughs> I kind of forgot. The, the second question was, do you think that in the debate community, there is currently underrepresentation um, with regard to different sects of, LGBT, of the LGBT community or women? But also, I just wanted to say that your answer to the first question was so good. Like, <laughs> like that was so important for um, people to hear that. But anyway, that was the second question. Yeah, okay. So the second question. Um, the beauty of the debate community is that your gender identity isn't something that is generally highlighted or like given that importance, not in a bad way, like, oh, we don't care about your gender, but in a way that it doesn't affect your debating ability or how people perceive you. Um, there are a lot of prominent women and gender minority debaters in the Philippines that have rose to prominence, not because they belong to the minority or they belong to a certain gender identity, but because they're really, really good debaters. And I feel like even though, yeah, there are parts or sectors of the LGBTQ community, uh, the queer community that is unrepresented, but it might be because they personally feel like they're not comfortable to come forward about their identity yet. Like, what if they just prefer to identify as a cis male before realizing that they're actually a gender or non-binary, which was generally my case before I discovered or I identified as a gender or non-binary um, last year? Or what if they just generally feel like it's not that important of a like piece of information that they should share like if you suddenly come out and say that you're asexual or aromantic that won't give you the win over a team that's relatively good over you right because the debate community is objective and perceives things on a scale that should be rev like revolving around objectivity and how good you are and how um, robust your points are but it's also great that regardless if they are comfortable to come forward about their identity or not, um, that the debate community is able to welcome them regardless. So I think there's a saying, I don't know where it came from, but it just went into my head, that whenever you're ready, we're ready to accept you. If you're not ready, it's fine. We'll still be ready when you are. Yeah, so I, I think that's also really important. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of people that don't want to highlight the importance of their own gender identity in debate rounds. But it ends up becoming a huge factor, especially when we look at microaggressions. For the longest time, for example, I wasn't the type that took into consideration the fact that I was a woman in debating. Until there was a round, for example, that someone accused me of winning just because I was a female. And that I looked like a particular way and therefore judges were more likely to give me a win or find me more persuasive. So obviously that was very offensive. Um, and it didn't bother me at the time, but I have heard so many people have similar experiences, like sort of microaggressions that state that women only get far because of their boobs or something, or women don't deserve to be here in the first place because they're too emotional for the sport. So given that, so we have representation, assuming the best case that women are 50% of the community already. How do we deal, therefore, with these forms of microaggressions that might be deeply rooted in the fact that we're in a conservative country or in the fact that there's still just a lot to unpack and unlearn? 
So that is a very heavy discussion to try and unpack because as much as we try to be progressive and liberal and open, there are still people within our circuits that generally have these microaggressions that tend to have these negative or detrimental perception of you based on your gender identity, um, if you're a woman or you're non-binary or you're gay. And it's really something that baffles me because in rounds we fight about breaking glass ceilings and making sure that people are empowered and have affirmative action. But at the same time, we tolerate or ignore these instances of microaggressions um, towards uh, like people who just want to debate because it's fun. I think the best way, and this is already existing, but needs a little bit more improvement as well, is through clear equity policies that deal with how you're supposed to assess an individual based on how they are presenting themselves. Like a quote that I really like from Grey's Anatomy is from Christina Yang, where she says, I'm not beautiful, I'm brilliant. If you want to compliment me, compliment my brain. And I feel like that's the best way to approach these kinds of things, right? You don't appreciate a debater based on how aesthetically pleasing they are. Although some may say that aesthetics play a role into how you are appreciated as a debater, but you base your appreciation on how well they make their arguments. Equity policies can help in making sure that these are things that are further like sustained and maintained and round. Like if we want, we can make it so that debaters can actively assess whether a judge is treating them unfairly based on their soji. Um, and they can raise it to an equity panel. So that's why I said that equity policies have a long way to go. We've seen the rise of ZPPs last year. We've seen the rise of anti-harassment policies and safe spaces acts by multiple tournaments. But we really need to assess what type of safe space are we trying to create? Is it a safe space that only deals with the worst of the worst, where people feel like they're uncomfortable of continuing in a tournament because they're being harassed or they're in a place or in a debate room with someone that they have had they had negative experiences before or is it something that we can work with proactively where if you feel like you're being oppressed based on your soji you can complain to the equity committee and agcore and equity can deal with it immediately assess the um judge like assess the round retroactively um and even allow for more protections for you to occur like not allocating that judge to you again or like maybe even, I don't know, not allowing the judge to participate. Like it's all very speculative because we don't know how to create the best safe spaces because as debaters, we always assume that we're good people anyway. We're, gonna, we're not gonna oppress or harass an individual based on their soji. But it's really something that we need to deal with and something that we need to address as a community. Yeah, I also like how because the debate community has created more zero tolerance policies against sexual harassment, I actually know people who have implemented similar policies outside of debating. Like Nina and I have a friend who is a Twitch streamer, and they also impose a zero tolerance policy against sexual harassment. But let me ask you something about a sort of gray area with these policies. How do we apply them as against Siguro minors, for example? Like, what if a minor um, violated a zero tolerance policy against sexual harassment? How should a tournament react to that? Or an equity panel, how should they decide on that? If the policy says kick them out, should the equity panel kick them out? Because I feel I, I encountered, um, I didn't actually encounter this sort of situation, but this question was posed to me while I was writing the zero tolerance policy. And I said uh, for a debatable open, and I said, this is something that the community needs to discuss as well. And it's not really just up to me to decide for the rest of the community. So what do you think? That's very interesting because age is also a protected attribute in equity policies as well. So what happens when a person with a protected attribute commits an equity violation? I personally would say that regardless of who that person is, if they made someone feel unsafe, if they made someone feel like they couldn't continue the tournament um, with their presence in the tournament, then yeah, it's justifiable to kick that person out of the tournament, even though they're minors, right? Because 
um, we have to also consider that these are people who are learning life, but are also assumed to have learned life at a rapid pace. So debaters generally have a better perception of the world because we're so open to ideas. We're so um, like intense in processing certain clashes and certain conflicts. So we have a, a relatively deeper understanding of what safety, what protected attributes are, what harassment looks like, and why we shouldn't do it. So even if this person, for example, was a minor, um, if they willingly did it and they continually did it to the point where a person felt unsafe, then I feel like it's relatively okay to kick them out of a tournament. Of course, uh, this cannot be applied unilaterally. So don't quote me on this on your equity policies, y'all. But um, every case needs to be approached on the facts of the case and like what really happened between those people. But if it's something that causes harm to the victim and it's something that was um, done repetitively without remorse, then it's something that can be considered as like disqualifiable, if that's a word. Okay, so I guess the last question I have before we end this and give you the floor to promote whatever it is you have to promote, um, I, I wanted to ask more about gender pronouns in debate. So you did mention it quite a bit at the beginning, but what I noticed in different tournaments is that they're not really strictly enforced. Or at least a lot of people have questioned the necessity of it, especially when we can just refer to certain speakers as panel or prime minister. What do you think is the inherent importance of identifying each other's gender pronoun, even if we have a neutral way of addressing people, which is just calling them by their speaker positions? So I think the way the reason why I like stating pronouns if people are comfortable is because it provides people with options, right? So if you are in the heat of the moment delivering a speech, saying prime minister is very like, that's like three or four syllables, I can't count, but like it takes a, a bit of time compared to saying like she said or they said uh, or he said, for example. So I feel like it just gives you more options, but of course it's not that shallow as well. Um, it also allows for people to not misgender you. Um, and I do agree it's something that is new and is something that is generally unregulated in terms of how you enforce it. Um, I've also had experiences where I have been misgendered, but I don't really like confront them about it because I also understand that there are instances where in the heat of the moment, you forget or like you, you switch to the conventional, you switch to what you're used to. But if it's something that's repetitively done, I would raise an eyebrow or two, maybe an eyelash, I don't know, but like, um, I would probably talk to the person and approach them like, hey, my pronouns are actually they or them. So if you could kindly refer to me as these, um, et cetera. And most of the time when those happen, uh, that, thing, that sort of thing happens, they are usually apologetic. Like they, they say, oh, I didn't mean it. I'm so sorry, I was caught in the moment. So it allows for people to be generally more respectful in a sport that was made to bring down other people's points and their discussions and arguments. So it allows for, I don't know, I just feel like it, it makes rounds generally more welcoming and more warm and cozy and cuddly and like less intimidating as well. But also it allows for people to own their identities. I've never felt as empowered as they have than when I started my um, grand final speech in MPDC by saying my pronouns. And that's because that was the first time that I was able to say that in a large space with people who are my friends, who are my peers, um, and people who know me, who've known me as Miko Bombeo, um, who used he, him pronouns in the past. So it's a great way of reintroducing yourself and at a time where you are comfortable. And it's really empowering as well if you come into your own identity and you allow yourself to experience that to the fullest. So is it something that is vital to be policed and something that it needs to be regulated? Mm, probably, but these types of things are dealt by individuals themselves. And is it something that is necessary? No, the reason why the panel says that you can say your preferred pronouns if you want to um, is because they understand that pronouns are things that might be touchy subjects for some people. So if they live in a household that doesn't know that they're trans or that they identify as a gender 
then they can say that they're not comfortable stating their pronouns, that you can refer to me as my speaker position. But if they want people to refer to them as their pronouns, if they want that and they're comfortable with that, then that gives them the option to do so. All right. Thank you so much for talking to us about all these different aspects of representation. Well, because it's pride. We, we talk about these kinds of issues all throughout the year. But for this month, we'd like to say that actually all of our episodes this month will be either made with or written by or talking about very important issues to the LGBT community. So thank you for being our very first episode in that effort this month. Um, that's it. Nina, do you want to say something else? Yeah, I want to give Miko the floor because I know they have something to promote in terms of this month. Yeah, so um, before I promote things, I'd just like to thank you guys too for inviting me to like speak on Debatable. It's like, it's been a dream to speak on a podcast and on Debatable. So it's nice to be in the company of friends and talk about things that I'm passionate about. For the promotions, phase two of Pride Debate Open is ongoing. Um, by the time that this episode is released, I don't think that the full AgeCore panel um, has been announced. So currently, who the people who have been revealed is Denise Tan, Joey Manzano, Sally Lee, and of course, the Beatles very own Nina Tomas. Um, and they will be joined by other stellar people really soon. Um, the link is on the Pride Debate Open page. Uh, you can look at it, you can click it, assess whether or not you want to join, but please join us. It's a really fun tournament. We have a great edge core and we have fun motions. Like who knows, maybe there'll, there'll be a sports motion in a pride tournament, I don't know. But yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun time. It's our way of celebrating pride, even though we're socially distant and in our homes. So I hope you join us and hope you celebrate pride with us. Yeah, so that's it for this episode of Debatable. Once again, thank you so much, Miko, for joining us. Um, we hope the people who are listening to us in Discord also had a fun time. I know I did. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.